Hello again. We're going to introduce ourselves one more time. Hami Takepi, Ampeti Washte, Iuha Chante Washte, and Ape Chiuzapi, La Hotia Zintkala Oloami Imachapi, Washituya Cindy Farley Imachapi, Wakpa Washte Hemataha Kshto. Hello, my relatives, and good day. My, um, I shake your hands with a good heart. My Lakota name is Songbird Woman, and my government name is Cindy Farley. I am from the Shine River Indian Reservation in North Central South Dakota. And I am a co moderator. Puju, Megan Portion, Indigenous, Wabazishin, Indodem, Mashkazibing, Jinakade, Shkonigan, Wenji Bayan. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Megan Forsha. I'm from the Bad River Band of Ojibwe. And before we kick off this youth panel, I just wanted to give a shout out and a huge thank you to the Intertribal Agriculture Council for sponsoring this Youth Voices session. Um, they made an incredibly generous contribution to our scholarship fund um, that's responsible for bringing a lot of these youth here today. So I wanted to make sure that we recognized um, their generosity and their continued support to the future of Indian agriculture and specifically to supporting our, our youth leaders here today. All right, Zaima, Nanani Ha Marco Ovando, Dosa Wihi, Numa Numa. Hello, everyone. My name is Marco Ovando. I am a proud citizen of the Shoshone Paiute tribes in northern Nevada and southern Idaho. I am from the White Knife Band of Western Shoshone and the Winnemucca Bands, descended from the great Sarah Winnemucca of the northern Paiute. Kuchihima Machuksis, Ekane Yasanu Lilian, Ekane Numiwakayon. Hello, everybody. I'm part of the Ion Band of Milwaukee Indians Tribe in California. Um, I am a youth representative for the Intertribal Agriculture Council, and I also just completed an internship with them. I'm looking forward to sharing my experiences with all of you. Saguli Swakwek, Lucas Ni Yun Getz, On Yoteaga Ni Waguaho Ni Waki Loda. Hello, everyone. My name is Lucas. Um, I'm of the people of the Standing Stone, also known as the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. And I said I'm Wolf Clan, so I'm living up in uh, Minneapolis right now, working on an organic farm. Um, while I have the mic, I'm going to do a little plug right here. So I'm a seed keeper, and um, if there's anybody from the Hidatsa, Rikara, or Mandan tribes that uh, keep their ancestral seeds, if you want to come find me afterwards, I want to talk about some seeds. We're trying to identify a seed that we have. So if anybody knows anything, uh, I'll be with the hat. So thank you. <laughs> OK, to start things off, um, and we can start with Elise and build off of everybody else. So the first question that we have is, who or what inspired you to do the work that you're currently doing or that you want to, want to or plan to do in agriculture and food and nutrition? Um, so. It's really loud, sorry. Um, what I, well, I went to the first IAC meeting in 2014, and there's something about Ross Racine and Zach Dushno that when they talk, they just have everyone's attention. Um, and I think Ross was the first one um, that caught my attention and said, you know, he first kind of instilled everything um, that the Intertribal Agriculture Council is called Intertribal just because we need to work together as a tribe. We all have one goal, and that's to make Indian country healthy again. And that never occurred to me before the IAC, the Ag Summit, the IFAI. Um, so he was probably the first one to inspire me. Um, and I have like a whole list of stuff I want to do. I just don't know how I want to do it or in what order. So until I came to Seeds of Native Health, Two. No. Uh, in 2016, I think I was still believing that I was going to be an engineer after I graduated from college. And during that event, I realized we need our communities to get excited about traditional foods so that everyone working on access and revitalizing our connection to our foods um, will have that energy returned from the communities and they can create self-support. So um, I 
jokingly came up with the idea that I was going to launch a cooking show called Indigi Kitchen then. And I don't think anyone believed me <laughs> until I did it. <laughs> um, but it was actually, it was uh, this event or what became this event that actually inspired me to do the work that I'm doing. Um, so like I described in my presentation, um, it was primarily my dad who got me interested in what I've been doing, uh, my research with Buffalo. Um, and so I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, what inspired me to continue what I was doing was um, actually seeing the youth get involved in things that I want to be involved. Like I was kind of jealous of some of these kids going off to like DC or elsewhere off my home reservation and doing these amazing, wonderful things. And I'm like, I want to be a part of that. So I latched on with different organizations um, and just pretty much rode the ride with them. One organization in particular, uh, the Future Farmers of America or FFA, I really got attached to seeing how, first of all, you get to wear the awesome blue corduroy jackets. <laughs> love those things to death <laughs> and then overall just seeing how confident um these individuals are like once you put on that jacket you're a totally different person and it's a better person and but there was also not a lot of native american representation you see all these people there but you don't see that many natives and i was like why is that so my home chapter was one of the largest home um, chapters in the FFA organization for having the largest number of Native Americans. So I was like, that's pretty cool. And I got involved in that. And then somehow became uh, the first Native American state president in the organization's 90, almost 92 years of history now. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, it, what inspired me and continues to inspire me to do these things are seeing the youth, taking these opportunities that are presented to them, and being able to do things, push the envelope, and pretty much write our own narrative. What has inspired me is the Intertribal Agriculture Council. Um, I started getting involved with them about a year ago, and since then I've had many opportunities to um, come out and present, be on panels, um, experience a bunch of different things, and then become exposed to many different aspects of agriculture as well. Um, I also heard, I don't remember who it was, but I was sitting in a presentation yesterday, and I heard somebody say that the forest is like our Walmart. You have everything at your fingertips. So that kind of inspired me as well. Uh, who or what inspired me to do the work I'm doing. Um, I think about four or five years ago, I got involved in agriculture. I had a work accident and I uh, got a finger cut off, my pinky finger, and I just needed a life change. So I was talking with my sister and uh, my sister was the one that recommended I get involved in agriculture. So I think my sister is, I have a big shout out to give to her. So from there, I think my involvement with the IAC is what inspired me to do work with youth and continue down this uh, food sovereignty movement. So I think that's about it. Nice. So that's how me and Meg know each other too. So just a little plug for the IAC. Um, so to kind of get off of that, because uh, most of you are from different tribes, in what ways does nutrition relate or correspond to native values and culture as a whole? And in what ways does it relate or correspond to your culture specifically? Um, I think all of our answers are gonna be similar and I think everyone else in this room uh, has a similar answer, but I think it's deeply tied to, um, our culture is deeply tied to our land. Um, like, <laughs> I was trying to come up with different answers for this, but um, has anyone ever seen like a Sweet 16 or a Quince on a res? We, I don't. Um, I have my first kill, my name giving, my first catch. Like, you don't see that. It's deeply tied to our culture. And I think a lot of it is just we were born with it. We never have that um, other Western um, events or anything like that. But I think agriculture and gathering and hunting and fishing have a lot to do with our culture and it's the center stone. 
Yeah, I think when it comes to nutrition, it goes beyond just what we're putting in to nourish our physical bodies and give ourselves the caloric intake in order to execute our daily tasks. I think for native people, it moves much beyond that. And not only how our food is taking care of us, um, but how we're taking care of our food and where our food is coming from. Um, I feel like by revitalizing that connection to our different traditional systems of harvest and gathering and uh, traditional farming methods, I think we recognize um, all of these other cultural ties and the needs to take care of those spaces and those creatures. Yeah, I agree. And I think that um, nutrition for Native people is much more decompartmentalized. It's not put into these tiny little boxes, like you were saying about caloric intake and carbs and fat and protein and all that, even though I am studying buffalo fat. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a lot more than that. It's about true nourishment. And we don't just nourish our bodies. We nourish our spirits and we nourish our minds. And I think um, Native culture does put a lot of emphasis on the land and how you get food and how you take care of the land, how you take care of the animals, and just understanding that we are all related and that it, we are all interconnected and that... Um, just not compartmentalizing things like that, I think is how, um, is what the true definition of n nutrition and actual health and wellness is um, across Indian country. Yeah, I completely agree with what all these fantastic women have said so far. Uh, growing up, my grandparents always thought of it as, think of yourself of the land, because in reality, all of our peoples, all of our creation stories, we're a part of the land. We come from the land. My creation story, personal, um, for in our, my tribe, we personally came from clay that was found in our riverbeds. So we came up from the land and consider ourselves the food of the land, and we're all interconnected. My grandma always told me, think of it as like a big giant web, how we're all interconnected. One facet affects another facet, and so on and so forth. And by thinking of it in a, like they said earlier, don't um, depart, come from. <laughs> compartmentalize, oh, I slaughtered that word, and um, pretty much just focus on that. It's not like one line, it's an interconnected web, and that's how we as Native peoples always saw that, and I think that's a great thing. So I agree with all of you as well. Um, we as Native people are so connected with our land, our animals, our plants, and everything. Um, specifically for my tribe, Miwok people, acorns were was our staple food, so we would make nupa, which is acorn soup, different breads, like we used acorns for everything. Um, so just a little quote that I also got from an IAC conference, um, you can't be fully sovereign until you're food sovereign. Um, I definitely agree with what everybody said up here. <laughs> Very good words. Um, so. I think that as indigenous people living in this world that we are, there's lots of new medicine, lots of new pills that we can be taking, you know. There's drinks that are full of antioxidants, there's pills that have all these vitamins, minerals, and everything in it. And I think there's dangers in that. I think there's dangers in separating all the stuff out of the food. I think that us wild harvesting some blueberries or some cranberries, you know, getting our antioxidants from there and getting our proteins in full, um, corn bean squash soups, everything like that, you know, I think that that definitely relates to um, native values in general. So I think that us as indigenous people, we need to walk, be mindful of where we're walking in this new world. So, um, yeah. Beautiful. We are all in agreement on this <laughs> stage. We're all on the same page here. So. No, but, but really I think, I think the fact that we're all on the same page is really important and I think it, it really goes to show that there's a growing movement of youth across Indian country that, that feels this way about the health of our communities, the health of our culture, the health of our environment. And these, these young people up here today have really important and powerful things to say. And so the question I wanna ask you guys is, how has the label of youth 
um, impacted you in the work that you've been trying to do? Like, how has being labeled as a, as a youth impacted the way people perceive you and the message that you have to share? Well, I know for me, um, I've pretty much been a youth my whole life. I'm only 19 so far. <laughs> <laughs> so all of the work that I have done, um, sometimes it depends on like the setting, uh, but mostly people perceive youth as someone um, below intellect, someone that's below uh, wanting to have these serious conversations with, and that's totally the opposite of what we are as youth. Uh, it pe blows people minds out of the water when they youth come up and do all these extraordinary things and you're just like, I never thought a youth was capable of that. But the youth are in fact capable of doing such amazing things. Uh, I know when I was, a uh, personal quick story, um, I was working with the state of Nevada for uh, drafting some legislation to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day in the state. And I remember this one lady in particular was like, what do you know about anything? You're just some kid from the reservation. And I'm like, I have thousands of years of generations and history and cultural ties to this land that is now called Nevada. So I think I know a thing or two about having to draft some legislation recognizing, <laughs> recognizing the status of indigenous peoples here in the state. And it's just something like that. But then at the same time, youth are also revered, that we're also people who have the answers for, not just the answers for tomorrow, but answers for today. We see things from a different perspective. And that's something I think we can all agree on here. Now I have to follow that. No, I have some thoughts about this. Um, I, I think it is, um, I, as I'm, I guess I'm classified as an elder youth now. Um, I got mistaken for Elise's mom when we checked into the hotel, so I don't, I don't really know what's going on. Um, but it, it is also my, my label as a youth that has enabled me to get involved in the food and agriculture and nutrition sector. Um, it has been funding for youth programs that have brought me to different events and enabled me to make connections and uh, build the type of work that I wanna be doing. Um, but that said, there is also um, the l stereotypes that come with youngness, and youngness is associated many times with naivety, naivete, <laughs> ignorance, um, and, I, and I think um, where there is less life experience, there is also more potential to learn and uh, explore everything um, and really to be open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. Um, and I think youth as... Um, a group being the most susceptible to familial and community changes find themselves almost the miner's canary of where community well-being is. Um, they don't have their own money, so it's so much dependent on where the community's at and where their families are at, and uh, young people can see the problems, like middle class, middle age people cannot in many ways. I think the negative connotation that can sometimes surround the word youth um, comes from generations of colonialism. Um, because for me personally, I mean, a lot of my successes have been so impressive because I was so young when I did it. It's like, oh, wow, she did all of this when she was so young, and isn't this incredible? And while that's led to a lot of really amazing opportunities for me, it wasn't like that comes from some level of doubt, doubt that someone my age would have been capable of doing something like that. I'm an anomaly for being um, that competent. Um, whereas in my culture, um, children, youth are looked at as being sacred. I mean, that's understand, understood by our native people and our native culture. 
And um, so, I mean, I have a lot of support back home from my entire community and from a lot of elders, and that means more to me than anything else does. Um, and uh, I, oh, I had something to say to what you said. It was really great, and I had something, and I can't remember it, so. I will say that I am very pleased that our name tags at this conference just had the little speaker thing on it instead of youth speaker um, because I think that's enabled me to communicate with people that are meeting me in a much more productive way. Yeah, so I think I'm right there with Mariah being an elder youth, right at the cusp of not being a youth anymore, but I'm definitely going to keep coming to these events as long as I can, because I think everybody here, we're all empowering each other. We each come back to these events with new stories, new tales of what we've done in our communities, and we are all, are all still youth, we're all still young, but I think that the title youth does have some negative connotation, as Elsie said, that... You know, just because we're young or we have the label youth to us, we're not as capable of capable of things. So I think that it is kind of dangerous looking at us as young, naive people when everybody here is full of experiences, full of knowledge, and you know we're the we're the youth that will change the future. So I think that uh, I'm gonna stop talking now. So um, I think. When I read that question, everyone just thinks of like millennials, the younger generation. We're always on our phone, um, doing Uber Eats or just Facebooking. Um, but there's some of us that are like researching buffalo fat. Like who does that? It's a native ag nerd. I mean, come on. Um, I read the Farm Bill recommendations that were set by the Native Farm Bill Coalition. Um, I think the biggest thing is I know some people are very hesitant about having youth come in or youth taking over. Um, we are trying to learn as much as we can as in little time as we can. Um, I think for me, um, the biggest thing is seeing um, blood quantum, how that's a big issue. Um, but Native Americans are huge. We aren't um, as uh, population-wise, we aren't as big as we used to. Um, but a lot of us just want to keep and restore our traditions, our language, um, our traditional food, our first foods, our ceremonies. Um, a lot of, it's just, it's insane that I started in 2014 and wherever Mama Janie's at, I'm not sure if she's in here, um, <laughs> at Gila River, when she introduced me, she was like, she was one of the youth that was learning and now she's taking over a whole program. Um, you are seeing more and more you step up to the plate. We want to be in that position. We want to be there. Um, and that's what a lot of youth here are doing is they are trying to learn as much as they can. Um, I'm gonna spotlight my friend Jake Frank, just finished culinary school and is trying to be a chef. And Bringing them here is just something that I wanted to do because there's so many things that are happening that aren't happening at home. We have to travel. We have to be there. Um, and as youth, we are trying to bust our butt to get as much knowledge as we can. So I agree with all of you, but um, adding on to the end is I'm only 16 years old, so I've been labeled as a youth my entire life and still am. Um, um, so it's like no matter our age, like we're all out here still doing big things. So being labeled as a youth, there are like a, not, a lot of negative comments about it, but we're still out here like doing the work for it and I'm glad that we're recognized for it. So I just want to say, <laughs> that's really great feedback about the ribbons. <laughs> I was pushing for a youth ribbon. <laughs> I think I just wanted one more ribbon. <laughs> so I will keep that in mind for the future. I, the, I think a great follow-up question to that would be, 
what advice do you have for adults um, or professionals who are seeking or wanting to work with and involve youth in their programming or their efforts? I think uh, anyone that's ever been the native member of any advisory board <laughs> probably knows where I'm coming from <laughs> when I say uh, that there is a strong tendency to tokenize uh, individuals when bringing them into certain groups. Um, it often comes from a place of power and maybe it's older folks going, ah oh, yes, we'll reach out to this youth and bring them in and have like an honorary youth member or something. Um, just like I think uh, many of us have felt that way uh, in our communities and the community's desire to bring a native voice onto a board or a panel or something like that. Um, that said, I think there's many ways to talk to young people, but I think uh, the more we can avoid reaching out uh, to them specifically to represent all young people uh, and get a number of different individual opinions and experiences, I think uh, the better, the more advantageous their voices will be in your work. So I think we need to stop looking at it as a child labor and look at it as passing on ancestral knowledge, you know, <laughs> getting kids more involved in the gardening and digging up some carrots and weeding, you know, I think that's a good way of getting the youth involved in things. Um, that's what I want to say. Uh, I work at a, I work at a, Native owned and operated nonprofit organization where we do uh, youth programming there. And, you know, we're actually getting the youth out there into the gardens. We're teaching them about uh, some of our ancestral foods. We're teaching them about squash, beans, and corn, and the importance of building a relationship with these seeds, you know, looking at them as living, breathing beans, not just an item that you buy offline to grow for money, you know. We're showing them that, hey, our ancestors looked at this as a living thing. We had respect for them. We sang songs for them in the wintertime, in the summertime. So I think that um, getting elders involved with youth is a really good step, you know, teaching, passing on these um, old ways. That I think that's a good way of getting uh, youth involved. So. Yeah, and we see... Like I said, most of my experience with being labeled as youth and, well, being youth um, has been positive. I haven't had a lot of people look down on me for being so young. Um, and I think we see a lot more involvement. Um, like, a lot more people are becoming open to the idea of listening to the youth, like, because that's such a wild concept. Um, and so it's really fantastic that people of older generations are remembering um, how important youth voices and children's voices are and the sacredness that comes behind that. Um, but it's one thing to say, oh, this is great, look at what this young person is doing, we need to, we need to listen to them, and then helping them actually do said things. I mean, I don't doubt the competence of any young person here to do the, the, do the thing on their own, and a lot of us here have been doing it on our own for a long time, making it happen. But I think if we want to see real change and we want to really implement what the younger voices of um, Indian country are saying, that requires the older generations who are in positions of power to actually implement the things that young people are talking about and to not just look at it and be like, oh, look at these great ideas that they have. This is, this is really cool, good for you. It's to actually do what do what we're saying, do what we're asking, I'm, when reasonable, of course. But I think, um, I think just actually listening and learning how we can cooperate um, together um, across generations is really important because it isn't meant to be so separated. And we are meant to, um, I mean, elders are passing down knowledge for a reason. And it's because we are the younger generation and we are the ones going to be doing those things. And so at some point, we have to actually start doing those things. Um, and 
I think now as we're in a world that's changing very quickly um, and we're in a world that's modernizing very quickly, um, it's really important to listen to the younger voices. I just watched a Vice documentary called The Third Industrial Revolution um, and <laughs> this guy talks um, about how it is really important for like the older people who don't understand like technology and like how we can do this. Like I thought about this a lot during Mariah's presentation on digital media, um, how it's really great that she's here to present to people who maybe don't understand it as well as all of us who are on Snapchat and Instagram all the time understand it because like it isn't something to just look down on. It's where we're at right now. It's it's our world right now, and that that doesn't mean we can't live in the right way or a good way. It just means um, it just means we have to listen to each other, and I think that's what it boils down to. <laughs> Thank you, Caleb. <laughs> um, so I wanted to sit in on a tribal council meeting a couple years back, and the best way that someone taught me was you're supposed to be seen and not heard, and that's a saying a lot. Um, but in most cases, if we want or if we're supposed to take over and be the next generation, we need to be there. And it's becoming very, very, um, very, very kind of standard that we're just not going to sit there anymore. We're going to speak out. If we're supposed to be the next generation, we're going to speak out and we're going to be heard. Um, and that's, I think, what a lot of organizations have been doing. Um, but we're here. We are going to be there, and we're going to be there 50 years from now. Um, so. And I just wanted to make the comment, you know, about um, just because someone has less of a life lived does not mean they have uh, no life experience. Um, as stated and as seen on this panel, you guys have lived lifetimes of experience in each of your different fields, and I commend you for that, and thanks for saying yes. Um, so the next question that we have is, we've talked about the Intertribal Agriculture Council, but how have other youth programs such as IFAI, Unity, AHEC, ASIS, FFA, CNAY, some more plugs for you guys, um, better prepared you for where you are today? and on the panel. Um, so for my job requirement with Oregon State, they wanted at least a bachelor's in range and ag management or um, a college degree at least. Um, I did not have that. <laughs> I am going into my sophomore year um, of college and I did not have that experience. I had a whole lot of doubt, but in the interview, um, and I, Cindy kind of helped me kind of boost my self-esteem up. Um, but I had four years with the IAC. I had four years with the Ag Summit. I had three years at least with regional summits. Um, and then, of course, my experience with the food sovereignty assessment. But I think the experience that I had with the IAC has given me a lot a lot more of an education in Indian ag, Indian law, um, policy than high school even did. Um, so they have informed me very well. Um, the Ag Summit does a very good job of shoving a lot of information down your throat, especially. <laughs> <It's> the <best> way. <laughs> um, there's the time change you got to think of, but there is a lot of youth organizations that are out there, and I think the biggest um, coolest thing that I kind of geeked out about was the IAC actually has a youth position on their board of directors. They're putting their um, <laughs> money where their mouth is, and you don't see that in a lot of organizations. I think they're one of the only ones that does that. Um, they have a youth board, and they ha actually have a voting position on the board of directors. Um, so I think that's where the IAC dedicates and shows their commitment to youth. Uh, I know for me, I just recently got, within the last year, got more involved with the IEC and seeing what that all is. But my first stepping stones were involved with um, the FFA organization, being a part of that organization, being, getting the skills, the, some necessary skills that I needed to become able to st sit on the stage with these amazing people and talk to you. Uh, another way... Uh, was involved, like, I'm deeply involved with the organization called UNITY, and what UNITY stands for is United National Indian Tribal Youth. 
And with that acronym Unity, it pretty much just says what it is. It's a unity of native youth from all across the country that come together, share their cultures, share their life stories, their successes, their failures, come together, get new ideas off of each other, support one another, and make a better um, indigenous America, if you will. Uh, it gives us a voice to be the voices of our people for tomorrow and even today. Uh, I know there are several youth councils across the country who are sit at the same level as their tribal councils. They vote on past things. They work with their tribal councils together to approve things which are, could be amazing, great experiences. So yeah, it's just a little part of how I got involved in that stuff. And then from FFA, I want to learn more specifically, especially on federal Indian ag policy and how ag policy affects me as Native American. And so attending these conferences, the IAC, it gave me another stepping stone after FFA, after I retired as a state officer, to see what can I do now with something that I never knew I had a passion for. And being a part of this has really um, pretty much like strengthened what my position is as a person. So I've been involved with many um, different summits and conferences, more locally, but um, nationally, the biggest one is IAC. Recently, I completed an internship with them, which was actually a college student internship, so it was really amazing to just gain all of that experience and knowledge and exposure. Um, being able to work at the, our local plant material center with USDA government workers. Um, also, working with tribal elders to just get the traditional knowledge from them. So working with, um, it's kind of interesting. So a year ago, I created, I started a local youth group, native youth group. And so it's mainly just my family that lives there. But um, so what I do is I completed my internship and it was all working with traditional medicinal plants. And now my project is to restore those onto my reservation in Ione, California. Um, so throughout my internship, I kind of just got to work with elders, I got to work with government workers, and then also bring that to our youth, and then now having all the youth in my community just come together and create those projects. Um, so also, what, one thing I've been working on um, with the help of IAC is just knowing that there's a whole tribal community backing me up with any steps that I take. Um, so yeah, um, I've also given the youth in my community like opportunities to go to all these different events and just share it with them because I know um, coming from such a small community, we didn't have that many, um, we didn't know of many organ organizations. So just being able to bring that to my people and come out and get educated was really important to me. Since everyone's talking about IAC, I won't. <laughs> they spat off a whole bunch of acronyms, and for those of you who, oh yeah, it's an Indian conference, you should know all these acronyms. Um, besides IAC, um, I think IFAI, Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, has done awesome policy training, um, worked with shoving a whole bunch of information down our throats. Is that how we put it? Um, no, they've been wonderful. They've um, worked on bringing youth into farm bill advocacy along with the uh, IAC. Um, I think it was a particular moment when as the Native Farm Bill Coalition, we were having meetings in the White House and the representative that was there from the administration was trying to cut our meeting off and a tribal councilman stood up and said, no, our youth are our future, you need to listen to them. And it was the youth that closed that meeting and really showed what we wanted to get out of the farm bill. And for those of you who have worked on the farm bill, you're diving into intricate policy in food, agriculture, nutrition, forest management, uh, yeah, it's a lot. Um, and so we had to take the reins at the end of that meeting and wrap it up to summarize what we wanted. Um, and that 
kind of policy advocacy would not have been possible if not for the training that we've got through these different organizations. Um, I will also throw in a shout out for the Center for Native American Youth, um, housed within the Aspen Institute. Um, they do a lot of really awesome programming. I was really fortunate to be recognized as a champion for change um, through that and receive advocacy training through, I think it was one of Obama's speechwriters that came in and gave us this rundown of how to tell your story and get to the point, which I'm not doing right now, <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, there's a lot of great programs and they've done a lot of good things to bring us all up to the level that we're at. So I want to ask um, one, of, one of the questions um, on my list here. Uh, what advice would you give to youth wanting to be more involved or who are just getting started in agriculture, food, and nutrition? But I want to give you a little bit of a constraint on this question. Um, Aside from getting involved with the Intertribal Agriculture Council, CNAY, um, a lot of these great programs that we've already mentioned, um, maybe on a more of like um, personal level, like just how how can they um, maintain a, a cultural connection if they're going off to school to study these things and being away from their home? Um, how can they continue to pursue these things as a passion if maybe uh, other people in their friend groups aren't, aren't pursuing the same interests? Um, aside from these great organizations and great programs that we know are out there to support Native youth, on a personal and individual level, what would you say to Native youth who, who are finding themselves drawn to this field of food, ag, and nutrition? Well... I definitely think the IUC is a good place to start, but that aside, I think that there's a couple different areas of agriculture and health that you can look at. You know, there's the agriculture side of things, farming, you know, growing vegetables, growing animals, things like that. There's a the food side of things like preparing food in the kitchen. There's the health side of things. There's a lot of different sides of it. and. I think just figuring out to see which one you like, and if you don't know which one you like, you know, maybe just buy a couple seeds or find a couple seeds and grow them in your house. Find a windowsill and grow them. Get your hands dirty. Or see if you can throw together a wild rice soup or another kind of dish. Um, just doing it a little bit at a time, figuring out what you'd really enjoy. And you don't need to go crazy and rent out a full acre and grow it all yourself. If you're a 14 year old, you don't, you don't need to do that, but um, it'd be fun. I would have liked to do that. So I think, yeah, figuring out what you like and just doing a little bit of it and just working your way up. I think that's good personal advice that I have, so. Uh, pretty much there's something for everyone in agriculture. Agriculture is such as this wide, broad spectrum that pretty much has some component in all of our lives. A uh, good, great component is we all need to eat, right? Um, so by just like getting involved in something that interests you and diving deeper into it can help really motivate you to pursue something. I know for me, I come from a mostly uh, reservation, now urban background where agriculture is not that prevalent. And I want to learn more about how cattle are pretty much raised and grown and stuff. So. Something that I did was reach out to a local rancher in the area and ask if I could help them with whatever tasks. Um, mind you that I am terrible on horseback and um, can't rope anything. <laughs> but just getting out there and asking and doing your own research, like get your curiosity flowing, like who would have thought about lipids and um, bison versus beef? Like, yeah, like I'll go back to that because that's such an awesome example of someone who was curious about something in agriculture that they want to delve in deeper about. And another thing is just keep doing what you want to do, pretty much. First of all, thank you. Um, second of all, I think my biggest piece of advice would just be to believe in yourself, as cliche as that sounds. I mean, I didn't really know that I had a place in food sovereignty because what I had seen about food sovereignty didn't really align with what 
I, what was relevant to my culture. I don't come from an agricultural culture. And I thought food sovereignty meant gardens and farming and cattle, and that's not what my culture is about. Um, but if you just look into it a little bit more, you'll realize, just believe in yourself, because if you have an interest in it, it more than likely is entirely relevant to, to what um, is going on at, the, at a larger level. And um, just whatever you're interested in, believe in that. I mean, I thought, I, I had this interest in pursuing something buffalo. I, had no, I knew I didn't want to be a rancher. Um, that wasn't necessarily what I saw um, for my future and still isn't. But because of that, I thought, oh, well, geez, like, I'm not going to be able to pursue that then as like a career. I, there's no job that just likes to do stuff with buffalo. But the more I looked into it and the more I trusted myself, not just because that came naturally, but because I had an incredible support system, um, the more I realized that those possibilities are there um, and they're um, abundant and you just have to look for them and it, you just have to persevere through what it is to be a youth and you just have to figure out how to navigate that because it will, it will pay off. Um, so I did an intern, or I did an interview with the IAC for an internship, and I know it's a side, I know it, I know it. Um, but they um, asked, you know, my experience and my response, and I was a little nervous at the time, but um, I even said that if they were to have someone, if they wanted me to get a tattoo of the IAC logo, I would do it in a heartbeat. But that aside, um, the IAC all these programs kind of give you a family that you don't get back at home. Um, and that's kind of going back on Mariah's thing is social media is huge in our generation. Um, if I needed to talk to someone about FFA, I'd go to Marco. If I were to talk to someone anything plant related, I would go to Lucas. Um, all these programming, it gives you a lot of networking and friends and family that you didn't experience back at home. Um, we're there and it's all for the same reason. We're within the same age group. We're all learning. We all, um, all have the same goal and that's something you don't get anywhere else. Um, so when you're at any conference or any place network because there's something that someone might offer that you don't know, um, but they also have the same common goal and will do anything to help you. I think um, there is a connection of elders waiting to be asked for information and a cohort of youth that are waiting for elders to be ready to teach them information. Um, if if I were telling my younger self what would be the best way to get involved with this, it would be to ask for what I need or what I am curious about. Can you take me hunting? Can you teach me how to fish? Can you teach me how to cook this weird looking squash? Like these questions um, are things I wish I would have asked earlier, um, but I think I was so nervous about trying to trying to make these connections but not be worthy of that information yet. So if I were giving advice to youth, it would be ask, but for folks that have knowledge to share, no matter how little knowledge you think you may have in something, reach out and share that. Because um, I think a lot of us are really nervous and don't wanna let our knowledge keepers down. Um, so we're waiting tell you deem us worthy. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be better at asking and others will be better at sharing. So we're gonna go to some audience questions now. Um, this one really stuck out to me. And if you know anything about me, um, it's not really a surprise. <laughs> um, so this question comes from someone in the audience. Your generation is going to have to face the harshest realities of climate change. What do you think about the intersection of food sovereignty, sustainable agriculture, and repairing our earth? 
<laughs> um, well, I think that in these times of crisis that are upon us, it's really going to be um, the indigenous population of our world who's going to be able to save it. Um, I think that it's indigenous knowledge that understands that we're all equal, that really places an emphasis on respecting the land and that we can't live if we don't treat the earth with respect, if we don't treat all of its inhabitants with respect. Um, uh, that it's, it's those people whose practices are going to be looked for and who are going to need to take charge um, when people have no idea what to do because the way we're living right now is not sustainable. And if we can get back to some of our traditional practices, all of those have sustainability built right into it. They're built on a foundation of sustainability. And so I think that, that really coming to terms with that, the rest of the world, the rest of the country really needs to come to terms with that because I think there's a whole generation of people who are ready, ready to take charge um, and are really excited to do so, um, even though it is coming in kind of dire times. If you want to stop climate change, I can tell you how. We just need to give the land back to indigenous people. <laughs> that said, I don't foresee that happening right now. Um, so, uh, we need to prepare to, I mean, we're bracing. Um, a lot of our communities are already feeling the impacts of climate change, um, and we are counting on our knowledge, our sustainable practices, our resilient um, management strategies in order to navigate this. Um, this isn't climate change is going to happen X number of years in the future. It's here, it's now, and it's hurting us. And this is especially the time to look at the things that will be threatened and the things that we need to protect and the knowledge that we already have in order to do that. And uh, occasionally it means also backing up that knowledge with academic studies that we can throw down um, to prove that this is how things need to be. Um, indigenous populations, despite holding a very small percentage of the world's land area, hold most of the biodiversity, um, and it's with those populations and with their knowledge that we'll be able to survive. Um, so I don't know about anyone else, but I tend to overthink things um, sometimes, but I think the biggest thing sustainable-wise was we need to take care of what we have right now. Um, I, I will fully admit this. I don't think I'm doing my part as a gatherer or a picker or a hunter or a fisherman or fisherwoman. I, <laughs> um, I think I can do a better job. I know some people can, but some people don't have that resources. I think also a part of it needs to come to, as a community, we need to get all of our ducks in a row on what we want to see and what we want to do um, for the next generations. And I think that's not a lot of circumstances, at least with my tribe. Um, we just need to kind of go back to the old way. Sometimes that may not be accessible, but we do have modern resources that will help us with those. So to piggyback off of what you were just saying, you know, going back to our old ways, I definitely agree with that. Um, right now, if we're looking at our food system, and climate change is definitely going to affect our food system, our food access, everything like that. Uh, a lot of our food comes from seeds that are grown in big operations. People need to buy in their seeds every single year. They have a dependency on these seed companies. And what happens when these seed companies go under? What happens when they can't provide seeds for us, you know? We're going to need to feed ourselves. So I think getting back to our old ways of keeping seeds and respecting these seeds, you know, reclaiming the seeds and the foods, the berries, the trouts, all of our ancestral foods in general, not just seeds, but our foods and working with them in a respectful manner, I think that'll help immensely. And 
We're not going to be able to reclaim that all right away in the next year or two, but there's definitely steps that every community can make going forward because climate change is definitely here. It's definitely happening, and it's kind of scary being this young and not sure what's going to happen in 20 years from now, you know, so. Okay, just because everybody is dying to ask uh, Elsie some questions about her buffalo, and it's the number one vote on um, pigeonhole. Elsie, it makes sense that what animals eat, grain versus grass, would affect fat content and character. Why do you think grass-fed buffalo is so much different from grass-fed beef? Ooh, I should have known this one was coming. So I guess I would, I'm going to take this from more of a grass-fed buffalo and grass-fed beef coming from more of a cultural standpoint and less of a nutrition standpoint. Um, or scientific standpoint, and that is that ancestrally and historically, traditionally, it wasn't beef. It was buffalo. We are buffalo people, the buffalo nation. And I think right there is the biggest difference. I mean, you look at the creation story, we came out of Wind Cave as buffalo and not as cattle. And I understand how important cattle, the cattle industry has been to a lot of people in my community. Um, who, that's their livelihood. That was my dad's livelihood before, um, before turning to buffalo and working towards buffalo restoration. And so I understand that and I understand why that happened. The eradication of buffalo um, really severely damaged our population. And that was intentional. The, they cut the buffalo populations down specifically to cut down the Native American population. It was specifically to try and eradicate Indian people. And so I think that while now that the buffalo numbers are coming back, I mean, we've lived so long not having these wild, huge, abundant herds. And it, yeah, maybe it isn't realistic to have this entire ginormous buffalo herd roaming all the way across North America anymore. But if we want to entirely get back to our culture, we need to get back to buffalo. And I firmly believe that. And, um, and I hope that there are some people who are willing to believe that too. Okay, and uh, like Meg said, for anybody who knows her, anybody who knows me, I'm a proud alum of Haskell Indian Nations University. Um, I really like to advocate for TCUs. So I'm choosing this question. Thank you for whoever asked it. For those who attend non-tribal colleges or universities, why did you choose to go to those rather than tribal colleges? And if the resources were available, would you transfer? Dun, dun, dun. All right. Um my undergraduate degree is from Columbia University in New York City. I'm currently attending SUNY ESF in Syracuse. Um, so I have never attended a tribal college. I actually, I applied early decision to Columbia and the rule is if you get in and you don't have a financial reason to not to, uh, then you're mandated to go. And I surprised myself and I got in which means that I didn't have a choice after that, but they also consider um, the school that I went to um, is generous with financial aid and my family income, which in my community is middle class, seems very poor to uh, Ivy League standards and they gave me funding to go. Um, that said, I spent a lot of time distance from my community and I'm really fortunate that in graduate school, while still not going to a tribal college, I have a native advisor um, that is allowing me to build a program that blends scientific Western knowledge with our traditional knowledge. And like this entire theme of this conference, to blend those things and to create the program that I want. Um, but that's, that's possible because of my advisor system. Um, so it, there's so many things to look at in the native communities at colleges. Um, but I'm, I'm fortunate that that's what I did. I don't know how it would have been different at a tribal college. I can't comment on that. 
Uh, I know for me, I'm a third generation college student. My grandmother and mother were both alum of Haskell Na Indian Nations University. Uh, however, I took the more public route and currently attending Boise State University as well as the University of Idaho. Uh, both are in Idaho, go Broncos. Um, <laughs> But uh, I chose to go to the, a non-native school just to get off the um, get off the reservation, pretty much, and experience uh, pretty much a new experience in life. Uh, I always like to get out of my circle every now and then, uh, go on a tangent or uh, go on a limb, pretty much, and experience something new, something that makes me slightly uncomfortable, but at the same time, that I'm perfectly perfectly capable of. So leaving the reservation, not knowing pretty much anyone in that city, uh, just pretty much just trying to be myself and be like a regular college student. And, but however, uh, Boise is only two hours away from my reservation and um, there's a lot of family that live in Boise and uh, it is in the traditional territories of my peoples. But at the same time, um, the resources there, uh, there is a Native American advisor and they do come and we meet every, like pretty much every week for lunch or dinner that sort of thing, and just pretty much just go on and see what kind of opportunities that there are for, um, that could be possible for people of color uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but mostly I did it for experience, just to get off the reservation, listen to a new perspective, and pretty much just uplift myself and enlighten myself on some of the methods that white people are doing out here. Um, so I am attending Central Oregon Community College. Um, I have not moved home. Um, after graduating, I even committed to Washington State University. They have an MOU program um, with the state of Oregon. So anyone in the state of Oregon that wants to go to Washington State, they get in-state tuition instead of out-of-state. Um, and I was kind of nervous about saying this, but I did get pregnant right out of high school. You know, stuff happens. Um... <laughs> Um, I have an eight-month-old. He's turning nine months next week, um, but I had to adjust life. I mean, um, I'm still going for the degree that I would have gotten in Washington State, um, but hearing all of Cindy's long stories about Haskell, I would transfer if there were any tribal schools, um, but I am heavily um, resourceful on a lot of um, people at home. Um, and so I definitely would go to a tribal college for sh sure. <laughs> um, so like I said, I attended Stanford University, which is, um, we like to say that it's not, a lot of people like to say that it's the Harvard of the West Coast, but we like to say that, um, that Stanford, or yeah, that Stanford is, or Harvard is the Stanford of the East Coast. Um, but one of the reasons I chose to go to Stanford was, uh, like um, Marco, I wanted to get off the reservation and experience something else. Um, and also, I really wanted to go to um, a big fancy research school um, that would give me opportunities to do my research with these people who were really thrilled by my research. Um, and also what really stood, stuck out stood out to me about Stanford um, was they have kind of a nationally renowned uh, Native American studies program with some really incredible uh, professors. And um, one of the biggest things is there is actually, actually uh, Lakota language is actually offered at Stanford. Uh, and I can take that to meet my language requirement, um, even though I would argue that it is not a foreign language. Um, but I, I still feel like that's really incredible opportunity for me to be, and I've always had a thing for California. I've wanted to be by the ocean, um, even though I found that I've missed the reservation a lot more than I thought I would. Um, I, I don't know if I would transfer just because of how good of a situation I have going where I'm at. Um, but I would tell you that if there was a Stanford that was um, on the reservation, I would, I would go to that one. Yeah, the college I went to, it was really, the program I went, graduated with, it was really the only program in the whole state that had that in it, so maybe if there was a tribal college that did have the same program, I would have went there, but I was just really drawn to that specific program, so, yeah. What was the program? 
uh, sustainable agriculture and food systems, which had beekeeping, aquaponics, um, it had tractor maintenance, it had soils 101, it had a bunch of technical classes like that. So it was what I was drawn to. Okay, well, I want to say thank you to everyone who served on the youth panel today, on the young ad professional panel today, <laughs> avoiding the term youth. <laughs> Emerging leaders panel today. Um, that's all the questions we have time for, but I did want to take just another minute to recognize that there are a lot of other young leaders in the audience today who um, couldn't be on the panel today for lack of time and frankly, cheers. So if you wouldn't mind um, taking a stand um, so that you're already up here, you can't answer for them. <laughs> If you wouldn't mind standing up, we'll all stand with you so that you feel supported. And uh, everyone give a round of applause for these uh, other incredible young people in the audience. There's more than it appears, but some of them are shy, apparently. Uh, miigwech, thank you. Mew, that's all. <laughs> 